Okay. Yeah. Uh, our internet's pretty slow right now, so sorry if there's issues with share screen. Um, and I, I don't know if it would be better for Eric to have him on his phone or uh, the physical book rather than reading from the screen. Okay. Uh, well, we can we can just read the the Psalms out anyway. So I've sent everybody a copy. Uh, uh, well, thank you all for tuning in, and it's good to see you all. And just we welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just a reminder: there's no Bible study tomorrow, God willing, or. Uh, road to recovery on Tuesday. We have the food bank on Wednesday and the prayer meeting, God willing, uh, will be myself leading. And come the weekend, I hope to take the services. And I think that's all. And with that, we'll begin our worship of God by singing to God's praise in Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us, every one, a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. To God's praise. Give me a second, Dalek, because that's different from what you sent in the... I'll just look, look it up. That's a new one opened. Well, I should go to it, right? Sorry, I'm not quite sure what's happening, Eric. Okay. All right, it's up there. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Night, guys. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us everyone. A joyful noise make to the rock. Oh, Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing songs to him with grace and make a joyful noise. For God, a great God and great King, above all God he is. Deaths of the earth are in his hand, the strength of hell is his. To him the spacious sea belongs, for he the same did make. The dry land also from his hands is
pray together. Father, we look to you to bless us. We pray, Lord, that you would draw near to us and help us to pray. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal Jesus to each heart, that you would reveal Jesus in the midst of our worship. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you are the God of all glory, the God of all grace, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the God who loves us. You are the God who loved us so much. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful things. Thank you, Lord, for the depth of your love. And Lord, we thank you today that we can experience that love through your word and spirit and in the reality of a changed life. We bless you and thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank you this evening that your word is going out to the ends of the earth. We thank you, Lord, for the communication you have given us with Zoom. We thank you, Lord, for the various congregations that are able to meet in measure. And we pray that you would build your people up, Lord. Bless them and encourage them with your word of truth. We praise you this evening, Lord, that you are the God who is the God who forgives sins, who can forgive sins but God alone. We thank you for that, Lord, and we come to you and confess our sins afresh, and we thank you, Lord, that in Jesus Christ you have removed our sins and you have cleansed us, and we bless you for that. We bless you, Lord, for the confidence we have in knowing that your word is sure and that your sacrifice is all sufficient and your word is truth, Lord. We pray this evening that you would guide us, Lord, in our worship of you in every aspect of our service, Lord, that you would be exalted, that you would be glorified, and that we could truly acknowledge that we have met with you in a beautiful way, Lord. We pray especially at this time for the nations, for the nations that are just distraught and distressed and burdened under the weight of COVID and the way it's affected them. Lord, we ask that you would bring relief, bring healing, and bring the eradication of this plague, Lord. We plead with you, Lord, to minister to us. We thank you for the vaccines that you have given and provided. And we pray, Lord, that as the vaccines are rolled out, that they would be efficacious and people, Lord, would be built up, that their immune systems would be strengthened and that they would be protected. We remember those close to us and known to us, Lord, uh, Ross and Haley, you know, Lord, they're really unwell. You know the exhaustion they've been undergoing and the difficulty that Kaylee has had breathing, having to go to the hospital, we pray, Lord, that you and your mercy would open up her airways, her bronchial tubes, Lord, and open up, Lord, her lungs that she might breathe freely and easy, and we pray this for Ross, and that you would take away inflammation, infection, and anything that's detrimental to their breathing, Lord. And, Father, that you would build up their strength, that they would no longer be exhausted and wearied, but that they would be invigorated, revitalized and refreshed in wonderful ways. And we do pray this, Lord, for every soul that has been struck down with COVID. And we remember the families who are mourning on account of death. Father God, bring peace and consolation and hope to them at this dark time, Lord. And may the light of the gospel shine into their hearts and into their minds and into their lives. And that you would bring the comfort 
of the gospel and the deep comfort of the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We do praise you, Lord, that you are the God who comforts the downcast. And we pray for those who are sorrowing, Lord, uh, on account of death in various situations. Minister to them, Lord. And Lord, you are the God who is close to the brokenhearted. Bless families today who are mourning loved ones and have faced Christmas for the first time without a particular loved one. Lord, our God, strengthen them. And we think of families, Lord, who have lost loved ones over the Christmas. Bless them and help them, Lord, and help them in their pain and in their confusion and bewilderment to seek you and to look to you and to find that hope that there is in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for our nation, our leaders, that they would be wise and that they would rule, Lord, and govern with integrity and dignity and with compassion, Lord. We praise you and thank you for our health service. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to support our health service and to provide all that is needed in terms of people, in terms of equipment, in terms of funding. And especially, Lord, as we think of overworked staff, that they would be refreshed and renewed and strengthened and protected in wonderful ways. We do ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless our congregation as well as a whole and everyone connected with us. We pray, Father, that you administer into every situation. We think of the elderly, of Nan, of Nora, of Katrina, Susan, and Elizabeth, and uh, Ian, Lord. We think of them as in a vulnerable age group. And we pray, Father, that you would be mighty to shield and protect them in the power of your spirit than the protection of the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus, that you would be around them as a wall of fire to keep sickness and disease away from them. And indeed, Lord, from every family represented here tonight and from every family that have not been able to join us tonight, be with them where they are. And likewise, Lord, grant, grant them the protection and the, the surety of your everlasting arms being beneath them. We think, Lord, of those who are uh, concerned and anxious for any reason, Lord. We pray that you would minister to them in a special way and that, Lord, they would find their hope and comfort in you and in your word that says, fear not, as they trust in you, Lord, that they would mount up with wings as eagles. We do pray, O oh Lord, for the community and the way that uh, the lockdown is affecting people. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would intervene to bring hope and comfort and that your kindness would be shed abroad, Lord, and that the love of God would be shed abroad to give hope in these difficult times. Be with DJ tonight, Lord, as he ministers to the congregation in Kalaka. Bless him and encourage him, Lord and anoint him with the sweet unction of the Spirit, that he might bring a word in season to those who are weary, Lord. And we do pray that for ourselves. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in the preaching of your word, in the singing of your praise, the reading of your word, and the gathering of your people together as one body here tonight, Lord. And we do pray that in all of it, Lord, you would be glorified. And we pray that we could acknowledge from our hearts that it was good for us to have been together here this evening. And we ask these things with the forgiveness of all our sins. In Jesus' precious name, Lord, and for his sake. Amen. We've got our first hymn, which is Across the Lands, and Christine's going to lead <coughs> us. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began, every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. To the praise of God, we'll sing this. You're the word of God, the Father, from before the world began, 
Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Yet you left the gaze of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you stilled the sea, yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, resting victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your wake. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Thank you, Christine. It's lovely. We'll turn to our Bibles in uh, the first epistle of Peter and the chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. And from verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets 
who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was to be made, was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. And we pray the Lord would bless that reading of his precious and holy word. And to his own name be honor, praise, and glory. And once again, we'll turn to praise the Lord in singing from Psalm 119, verse 41 to 48. Let thy sweet mercy also come and visit me, O Lord, even thy benign salvation according to thy word, to the praise of God. Let thy sweet mercies also come and visit me. Shall I have well with thy name? Give him an answer just as rightfully reproaches me.
Before we turn to God's word together, we'll pray together. Father, thank you once again for this opportunity to worship you together, Lord, to gather around your word and hear what God the Lord would say. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be wise unto salvation, that you would give, her, give us ears to hear eyes to see and hearts to understand, that you would take the things of God and Christ, make them known to us, Lord. We pray you would teach us now, that you would lead us into your truth, Lord, by the power and the grace of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, with the psalmist that we could truly ask, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things wondrous things in your law. Help us, Lord, to see Jesus. And when all is said and done, we pray that you and you alone would be glorified. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. For his sake, Lord. Amen. Well, I want to look for a little while tonight at First Peter verse 23, where we read, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of, not, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Much amen, our word for tonight. And the last theme in this chapter is the word of God, the scriptures. And we learn of how the scriptures are so important in the salvation of sinners. And we learn of the character of scriptures and their message to us. In verse 22, Peter exhorted his readers to love their brothers, which is other believers. And he says, as those who are born again through the living and abiding word of God, the gospel. Genuine and abiding love for others is only possible because of the love God has first shown to us in giving us Jesus and in giving us the new birth in Christ. And we can read about that in 1 John 4, 7 to 11. And, of course, in John 13, 35. Now, there was a philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, and he tells us the Bible is a letter from God. 
with our personal address on it. Imagine that. Today we could look up our emails and imagine having an email from God personally. And of course, when we get the Word of God, it is from God. And Queen Elizabeth has said, to what greater inspiration and counsel can we turn than to the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, the Bible? And this is Queen Elizabeth II, Her Majesty the Queen. Martin Luther said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It laid it lays hold on me. And this is marvelous because here we have the wonderful illustration showing us that the Bible is alive. It does things. The Word of God does things. And it counsels us. And the first thing we're told here is, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the abiding word of God. We can only be changed spiritually, truly, through the word of God. And the word of God is, of course, related to the conversion of a soul to Christ. And the significance of this change, born again. Imagine that, born again. This was a concept that Nicodemus found baffling, and yet he shouldn't have. He was the teacher of Israel, and he should have known what the Lord was saying. New birth is a clear term for a decisive transformation in the life of a person. It's a real happening. And the, the term is seen in John 3, verses 3 and 7. When Jesus spoke with Nicodemus at night, it describes salvation in that terms, a new birth. And it's a birth that not only changes a person, it changes that person's destiny. The new, the new birth places a person in the kingdom of God with all the blessings and responsibilities that come with that. Now, the wonderful thing is being in the kingdom of God, we are blessed, we are loved with an everlasting love. We are saved. We are saved from our sin. We are saved from death. We are saved from hell. But with these blessings come responsibilities. This new birth is a spiritual birth. Reading in that scripture, John 3, verses 5 to 8, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You know, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And Jesus then said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And then he says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And this is Jesus telling us the great mystery of the new birth being the work of the Spirit. And it's a sovereign work of the Spirit. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Jesus also said, it is the Spirit. Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. And then he said in John 6, 63, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Now, isn't that wonderful? The word of God is spirit and it is life. That's a beautiful thing for us to consider. As we read the Bible, the word of God is spirit, and it is life.
I remember as part of my work with the London City Mission, among other things, I worked as a chaplain in industry. Now, this was a wonderful gospel ministry that I loved, and it gave me wonderful gospel opportunities. I was blessed by God's grace to bring the Word of God into the lives of many people, their situations and circumstances, and I became part of their community wherever I went. And I found that everywhere I went, people wanted to talk about God. They wanted me to pray with them and for them. Now, there was one depot I regularly visited in Plumstead, and I got to know a lot of people, and many people would say to me, have you met Bob the Baptist? Uh, this was said to me a few times. And it seemed that on every occasion I was there, Bob the Baptist was this elusive person that I never got to meet. But one day I met Bob the Baptist. And uh, he was uh, English, but of some Turkish uh, origin as well. I had a conversation with him, and he was very much talking about baptism. He was with a Baptist church. And as I talked with him, I enjoyed my time with him, but I began to discern that something was not right. And I asked him directly, because sometimes we need to do things directly. Jesus was certainly very direct. I asked him, have you been born again? Are you born again? And he was silent for a few moments. Then he looked at me and said, I was born once. And I thought, I thought to my, I didn't say it, but I thought, that's what I thought. The Bible teaches you must be born again. And I reminded him of this. Do not marvel that I said to you, Jesus said, you must be born again. I encouraged him to look to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon was known to often preach on the text, you must be born again. And a woman came to him after the service one day and said, why are you always preaching you must be born again? Spurgeon looked at her and answered her very kindly because you must, and that's the answer to that question, because there's no other way the kingdom you can see. Not only can we not enter the kingdom of God without being born again, but we cannot even see the things that pertain to the kingdom. I remember I preached on that text in Weber Street Homeless Center, we used to get breakfast ready first. We had a very early start. We all got stuck into the kitchen for a hundred people every morning. And uh, well, I was only there two days a week. But, and then we took it in turns to coordinate the floor and took it in turns to bring a gospel message. On this particular occasion, before breakfast, we would always give the word of God. And after the word of God was shared, everybody could then eat. And I spoke for a short while, a short 10 minutes on the text, you must be born again. And after I'd finished preaching, a guy came up to me who was one of the people working there. And he said to me, do you know, in the Bible, there's no such thing as must. You must. Well, he didn't say it directly to me, but it was he was throwing. And he was, and I reminded him, these were not my words, but Christ's words. I'm not asking anyone to do anything. I'm telling people, I said, that Jesus says, you must be born again. He was confusing works with the divine imperative. 
you must be born again. There is no other way for a person to enter the kingdom. Like we said, or indeed see the kingdom. We need the divine new birth. We need the new nature. You see, the old nature will always choose sin. And the new nature will choose Christ. And, you know, born again, we're told, not a perishable seed. The seed in the change for something to flourish, to be born and flourish. We need seed. We know in human birth that seed is needed, an embryo. And we plant grass in our lawns by scattering seed in prepared ground. We plant flowers with seed. And there is the thought of the human biological and horticultural images of seed here. New spiritual life grows out of and is centered on the seed of the Word of God. The Word of God is portrayed as the seed in the new birth of a sinner. Born again, a rebirth, a new birth, a spiritual birth. And this shows the importance of the Word of God and its place in the ministry of the church. Jesus spoke about the seed of the word of God, and he spoke about the different kinds of grounds it falls on. And we can read that in the parable of the sower and the seed, Matthew 13, four, verses 4 to 9. And we can read, as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell, fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then the Lord says, he was here. Let him hear. And we see the wonderful work of the Word of God in the lives of people and how the Word of God and the seed can be squeezed out. Being born again is a sovereign work of God, His Spirit and His Word. But we are to listen to what Jesus says to us. We have a responsibility to seek God and to meditate upon his word, and to seek God and look to God for the increase to help the growth of the word. Now, often there is a lack of emphasis on the word of God. In some churches, it happens quite a lot, and there is emphasis put on various other things which are not in themselves wrong, but if they are squeezing out the Word of God and our time with God in that respect, then they are a hindrance to the work of God. They are a hindrance to the seed being sown and the seed being scattered and the seed being watered. The Word needs to be preached. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. We read of the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, we know that the serpent sowed seeds in the garden, but he didn't sow them in the garden. He sowed them in the lives of Adam and Eve. He sowed seeds of doubt, seeds of suspicion, seeds of pride and envy, resulting in disobedience to the truth of God, disobedience to God. Now, God's word is true. And God did exactly as he said he would do. He brought the judgment that which the serpent denied. We read that God's judgment, he judged the serpent and he judged Adam and Eve. And then he said, I will put enmity to the serpent between you and the woman, 
between your offspring, that is also Zera translated seed, and her offspring Zera seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The first mention of the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would crush the serpent's head, who would deliver us from sin, death, and hell at a great cost to himself. Jesus is indeed the seed of Eve, the mother of all living. He is indeed the seed of the woman, Mary, the virgin. He is not the seed of Joseph. He is the legal heir of Joseph. As adopted, he was the legal heir. He is conceived of the Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve died spiritually, immediately, according to the word of God. They disobeyed God and his word. They died physically, not immediately, but eventually. And by the grace of God, they were given spiritual life through faith in God's word. Faith in his promise of the seed. And this is what Adam and Eve were looking for. They had faith that God was going to send the deliverer. The God, that God would send the redeemer who would destroy the serpent. Now, the seed of the serpent, while being those who hate Christ, willing slaves of the evil one, like Pharaoh and Herod, but also the seed of the serpent includes sin, death, and hell. Uh, the Lord said to the serpent that it would crawl on its belly and eat dust all its life. And dust perhaps reminds us of the sin that the serpent feeds on the sin of man and woman. They believed God's promise, and because of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, they were looking forward like all Old Testament believers. They were looking forward to the coming of the seed of the woman. And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. You see, we're justified by faith, not by anything else. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in God's promises. Because of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, Adam and Eve live eternally, as will all who believe the truth. And that's the simple thing. All we need to do is believe God and receive his son, Jesus Christ, as the seed of the woman who crushed the serpent's head and on our behalf, destroyed sin, death, and Satan. And we're told in Ephesians 2, 4 to 5, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love, now listen to this, the great love with which he loved us, he's rich in mercy with great love. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, you see, every soul, that is born, every human being is born spiritually dead. Yet God, we're told, even when we were dead, in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then we're told, by grace, you have been saved. And the grace, of course, is the loving kindness of God, receiving the person and the work of Christ to blot away our sins forever. All who reject the truth are spiritually dead. And like everyone, they will be physically dead. And if they don't repent and believe the gospel, they will die eternally. And what a rich mercy we have in God when we were dead in our trespasses who made us alive together with Christ. You see, the Spirit gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. So the changing of the word and the character of the word, the, the character of the word is emphasized. It's pure. 
It's incorruptible. See, something that's pure is not corrupted because it is not by the virtue of any descent from human parents, the new birth, is being born from above. It's the old birth signifies only corruption and decay. And the sad things we are, thing is we are born to die. There is no permanent abiding life produced by the flesh. It is in this sense that it is spoken of as corruptible seed because it results in decay and death through the corruption of sin. And the word rendered seed is uh, spora, and it occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. Incorruptible, pure, corruptible. You see, all of creation is subject to decay. The ground human beings, animal life, everything is subject to decay, corruptible. But the only thing that is incorruptible is the word of God. The scriptures are pure. The purity in its content. The word of God is without error. It's inerrant. You will not find mistakes and errors in the word of God. Now, we're not talking about transmission, because certainly people can make errors in transmission, but the word of God is pure and undefiled. We only have copies of the original autographs of God's word, and while humans are fallible, God's spirit is infallible. He leads and guides, and he preserves his word, his infallible word. Gloriously, he brings his word through over 40 people over almost 2,000 years. And he used people in their circumstances, and he used them in their personalities to bring out his true word. The divine word is wonderfully cohesive. It is one divine masterpiece. Because God is the Lord of history. And when we say that God is sovereign, he's sovereign over everything. Even to the hairs on your head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without his permission. We have mockers and scoffers that say, oh, the Bible, it came through so many. Have they read the Bible? That reveals the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, almighty God who is Lord of glory and Lord of providence. Yes, God can transmit his word and he can preserve his word. He's the Lord of history, Lord over all things. He produced his word and he preserved it for us. The word of God is true, accurate, completely trustworthy, and like any other writing. Secondly, it's the purity, uh, its contact, uh, content and its character. A lot of the literature we have today is very wonderful and it's well, well worth reading. But the Word of God will not corrupt a character. It will purify the reader. And often, even literature that is regarded as a masterpiece can certainly corrupt an individual. And certainly various kinds of literature can corrupt nations. The word of God does not encourage sin, but warns against sin. The word of God does not pollute the reader's mind. It purifies the reader's mind. The word of God reveals the great love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God gives us hope. The word of God gives us comfort. And the word of God gives us consolation. Because the character of the Word of God is not only pure in its content, it's permanent, it's lasting. It will, the Word of God will never pass away. This is the imperishable seed. Human seed is perishable. 
all of creation, like we said, is subject to decay, but not the word of God. The seed of the word of God is imperishable. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Like we said, we may plant grass flowers, but they fade. And Peter quotes Isaiah 8, 40 verse 8, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Books and scrolls and literature come and go, but the Bible is still around because many books that were written long ago are silly and they're totally irrelevant. But the Bible is as popular today as it has ever been. It is as relevant today as it has ever been. Many books that are outdated, irrelevant, and even ridiculous have gone, but not the Word of God because it is the word of God. It's eternally relevant because the word of God is imperishable. We who come to Jesus will never perish because Jesus himself is the savior revealed in the word of God. And Jesus is God's final word to us. Jesus, in fact, is the logos become flesh. We mustn't confuse uh, the inscripturated word with the word made flesh. There is a connection, but we must not push that connection. God's love is eternal. His promises are eternal, and they cannot fail. The word is practical because it's a lasting word, and it's a living word. The expression may either refer to God as living forever, because he does live forever. He's the living God or to the word of God as being forever true. The Greek is good for both these thoughts. Of course, God lives forever. So does his word, because it is the very word, the living word of the living God. Now, the word of God, like we said, is not a dead book. It is alive, which means it's always practical, always applicable, always up to date always relevant, will never become antiquated or something that does no longer apply, something that's behind the times. The word of God is living, lasting, and abiding. It's living and active. It does things. Like Martin Luther said, Martin Luther reminds us that uh, it has feet and hands. It chases him and lays hold of him. The word of God does that. It, it won't let you go. It does things. And it will accomplish what God has purposed. Now, the same sun, this is a very serious thing. The same sun that softens wax, hardens clay. May we all have soft, tender hearts, submitting to the Lord and his word, that the word of the Lord would soften our hearts, that he would give us the heart of flesh and take from us and those others who are hard against the word of God, that he would give them the heart of flesh and take from them the heart of stone. May it be so. The verse 23 is a declaration that salvation does not come through a natural process. The seed that produces children of God remains alive because it's the living and abiding word of God, the enduring word. God's word lives and God lives and it endures the forever. He is the eternal God and his word is like him in quality. It's important for us here to get hold of the fact that Peter is drawing attention to the very word of God that reveals Jesus Christ. Although they have not seen him, they have believed Jesus and received him because his word has its origin in God. Peter tells us that the word of God stands forever. And today I want to leave you by sowing another seed of hope. And this is the gospel, friends. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. And another seed of hope, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And finally, in verse 13 of that uh, chapter in Romans, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a beautiful word of hope that is. Simply coming to God, believing and receiving, casting ourselves upon his love and grace and mercy. May God bless his word to us, the changing power of the word of God and the character of the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your precious word to us. We thank you, Lord, that all scripture is God believed. And what scripture says, God says. What the Holy Spirit says, God says. We thank you for that, Lord. And we pray today, Lord, that we would take you at your word, that we would put our hope in Christ, that we would truly have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who came from eternity to suffer and die in our place, as the one who rose again for our justification. May it be so, Lord, that we would have the simple faith and the wonderful faith to receive Christ and to follow him at all times. Lord, as I read earlier, F.B. Meyer said, as you receive forgiveness from the hand of the dying Christ, will you receive the Holy Ghost from the hand of the living Christ? To his name be praise and glory. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn now, which Donalda will lead us, and it's Have You Been to Jesus for the Cleansing? Are you washed in? Sorry, Alice, I think you've got a host right now probably because i fell out sorry oh, oh sorry am i the host hang on angus I, I know i don't know why that why that happened okay buddy there you are you're back as the host have you been to jesus for the cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And remember, grace is what we don't deserve. It's what God lavishes upon us. Be blessed. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you garments spotless of the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are you garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside your garments that are stained with sin. And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain 
overflowing for the soul unclean oh be washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are you garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb oh be precious is the flow that makes you white as snow oh no other font i know are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are you garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb Now we do pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit would rest upon you and remain upon you and all whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen.